churches and office buildings sometimes a pain in the neck more than a pain in the ne more than a pain in the neck my dad used to have to deal with those cuz the last few houses that they have lived in he would make improvements to but in order for them to count he'd have to make sure they were up to code we'll come back to building codes by the end first oh. I don't think I sent you my slides. Oh, nuts. Okay. I can only perform so much. Right. All right, so how, how are you guys doing with your surveys? All done. All done? Okay. Well, we'll do our best then. Um, I was on my way to ask a girl out. She worked in the administration building at my university, and I learned she wasn't dating anybody, so I made a plan a foreign language film because I was a huge dork and um, a place of a place to eat and then I worked up the nerve to go and ask her out alright you gotta you gotta get all of those things lined up and on my way I passed one of my professors and he stopped me he says hey Tom you had a thick uh, Eastern European accent you have something like huh, huh. I'm like, oh, shoot. So I went and looked in the mirror, just like in the, the verse that Sean read for us. And there was a little toothpaste right there. Now, what would you do? Would you leave it there? I wiped it off, and I went back to the dorm, and I went the next day to ask her because I lost my nerve. I was really grateful he'd stopped me before I made an idiot of myself, okay? What can I say about that date? Well, it was a good movie. And uh, several years later, I met Michelle. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> so we read from James, if you hear what God says and don't apply it, it's like you're looking in a mirror and don't clean up. I've heard it said that uh, also that the teachings of Scripture, teachings of Jesus, are like paint in a bucket. Paint is no good if you keep it in the bucket. You have to apply it for it to be any use at all. In the book of Matthew, Jesus is finishing one of his primary sermons. You also find the same parable in the book of Luke. Like most parables, like most teachers and leaders, Jesus probably gave different versions of the same talks. We should not be surprised if they're slightly different at times. That's okay. Uh, if you want to follow along, it's in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. This is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. This is, it starts with, Blessed are the poor in spirit, and it ends uh, right after this parable. Matthew 7, starting with verse 24. Very famous. There's even a song about it. Okay? This is, this is how it goes. Matthew 7, 24. Everyone who hears my words and obeys them is like a wise man who built his house on... A rock. It rained hard, the floods came, and the winds blew and hit that house, but it did not fall because it was built on a rock. Okay. Everyone who hears my words and does not obey them is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. It rained hard, the floods came, and the winds blew and hit that house, and it fell with a big crash. You guys know the song? Are you brave enough to sing the song with me? The wise man built his The wise man built his house upon the rock. Then what? And the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. Rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the rock stood firm. What about the other one? Okay. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the rains came down. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the sand went. That was good. 
You guys did great. And so the, we sometimes think of seeing a third verse. I'm not going to make you do that one. But it talks about building your life on Jesus, and the teachings of Jesus, and what he accomplished for us. So there's a lot of things that we could say about this story. It's, it's really, it's a, helpful, it's a helpful tale in a lot of ways. Anybody here ever make a sandcastle or mud pie? Okay. Anybody really good at it? No? Okay. Uh, if you've built one in the past, sandcastle, mud pie, uh, let me ask you, is it still standing? <coughs> what happened to it? The ocean came in, right? The tide happened. So they're not there anymore. What's the oldest standing building in the world? Anybody know? Once you get to a certain age, it's hard to tell exactly the date that they were built. The first one I thought of was the pyramids. No, no? Well, there's an older one. No, one of the Aztec uh, pyramids. Okay, that would is the oldest. Okay, so the, but it's a pyramid shape in Central America. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. That's what four thousand, five thousand years old, somewhere in there. Pretty old. Uh, closer to home, you got Chaco Canyon. Everybody, anybody here been to Chaco Canyon? Yeah. It's, it's sandstone, so you wouldn't think that it would last as long, and yet it's a thousand years old. That's pretty good. Stonehenge? Stonehenge is about that old. That one's even harder today because there's no writing system. But they're not built out of sand. They're built out of stone, and they're still there thousands of years after those who built them have passed away. So, <clears throat> we are uh, living today in a time in which people like to think about the things that Jesus taught without actually doing them. Did I leave? Okay, here's the remote. Okay. So let me ask. Do you want your life to be more like the pyramid in Central America or like the castle you built on the beach? You want it to last, right? Okay. So Jesus is talking about uh, specifically the Sermon on the Mount, but it also applies to the rest of the Scripture. Let's talk about the Sermon on the Mount here for a moment. There's a guy with toothpaste on his lips there. Okay. All right. Sean, you're a miracle worker. Oh, okay. Don't want to get too far ahead here. Now, when I was first exposed to the Sermon on the Mount, read it for myself. It looks like isolated teachings. He talks about one thing, and then he talks about another thing, and it doesn't look like there's much of a pattern at first. But then, once you start getting used to it, you realize he's talking about a particular kind of life. I said it a moment ago. I wonder if you could remember it, either from when I said it or because you read it yourself. How does the Sermon on the Mount start? Anybody remember? Blessed what? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they... Oh, that's weird. Okay. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay. And I didn't get all of my updates, but Sean, thank you for getting that up there. I still have the translation from before. So if you wanted to know what it says in Kenya or Rwanda, just pay attention to the ones on the right. Uh, otherwise, English is on the left there. <clears throat> okay. Pray, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so who is really lucky and blessed? Those who know that they don't have it all together spiritually. Raise your hand if you have, if you have it all together spiritually. Okay, I saw, saw a hand go halfway up and then back down again, but I think it was a joke. <laughs> Good. <laughs> all right. We all have needs. And the second that I start thinking that, that I'm rich spiritually, I'm actually... As Jesus says in the book of Revelation, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You remember that? Okay. So whoever is, really wants a good life has to start with the assumption that they are in deep spiritual need and they have to draw their life from God. And so the rest of the sermon kind of goes along with that. You could spend hours on each one of the teachings. I'm just going to hit some highlights here. Uh, at the end of Matthew chapter 5, it says, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who hurt you. This is being like God, because God loves everybody, even people who don't believe in Him, who hate Him, who say terrible things about Him. And if God is like that, if you want to have the same kind of life that God has in Himself, you ask Him for the help to do this stuff here, loving your enemies and praying for those who hate you. 
There's other things in that same chapter. That Jesus talks about how he didn't come to destroy the law of Moses or the teaching of the prophets, but to fill them full of meaning. And so he talks about if you lust, it's the same as committing sexual sin. And if you get angry with someone, it's the same as murder. Okay? A person who is godly has a changed heart. Matthew 6, there's more of a pattern. Jesus expects his people to give money to the things of God and to, to pray and even to fast, to go without food for periods of time. But he tells them to do it all secretly. And I don't know about you, but my temptation is when I do something good, I get really happy with myself. And I want to bring out a brass band <laughs> to announce it. But Jesus says if that's how you're approaching the good things you do, that's the only reward you get, okay? And he goes on to say, uh, don't worry about things like food and clothes. If God takes care of the animals and flowers, he'll take care of you as well. Instead of worrying about some little thing someone else is doing, work on yourself first. Do you like to work on yourself or work on other people? I prefer to work on other people because I can clearly see what they need to do different. And I get so frustrated when they don't make the changes I tell them to make. But Jesus says, if you've, got a, if you've got a two by four sticking out of your own eye, you cannot see to get an eyelash out of someone else's, right? That's tough. So I've got to work on me, and you've got to work on you, and then we can pray for each other, and that's as far as it goes, right? So at the end of the sermon, he gets to this place where he says, whoever hears these teachings of mine, that's where it starts, whoever hears the teachings of mine. Okay, so there's that sermon. The Sermon on the Mount is sort of Jesus' inaugural address. But there's other things in the Scripture as well, Genesis to Revelation, that are all actually teachings from Jesus or teachings about Jesus. The Scriptures, Old and New Testament, all point to Him. And so the teachings of Jesus are reflected throughout the Scriptures. Can you have a growing spiritual life without exposure to the Bible? No. Now, this can take different forms. I strongly encourage people to have a reading plan that they do. Just, just broad passages of Scripture. Some people like to go through it in a year. Some people like to take a little more time. Some people like to go faster. There's lots of ways you can do this. They even have apps now that will read the Bible to you and create a plan in the app so that you can follow a plan and the computer does all of the finding for you, right? There's lots of ways to expose it. The other thing is, another way of, of doing it, it has to do with meditation and memorization. How are you coming on Philippians? We haven't brought this up for a while. Okay. Uh, I got a little behind myself and I felt guilty about bringing it up again, but I started this week, so now I feel comfortable saying we've still got a couple months before the end of the year to memorize Philippians. Um, that's one way of dwelling on God's Word. What about studying in groups? Or being with God's people to discuss His Word. I bring this up because I want to ask you another question. How much of the Bible was written to individuals? There's a couple of them. There's a couple of them, but most of them are written to groups of, of people. The New Testament written to groups of followers of Jesus. Old Testament written for the benefit of Israel, uh, uh, God's nation there. It was mostly mostly written to groups. I don't want to say exclusively, but in any case, it's very difficult to expect to understand God's Word on my own when He was written for me and my church family. That means also that I've got to maintain a teachable spirit. And that can be hard, because the more you know, the more puffed up you get. Knowledge puffs up, the Bible says, right? Love builds up. And so uh, knowledge can be a, a barrier to learning. And so you've got to ask, I've got to ask the Lord for a teachable spirit and to go and be among God's people where I might learn something. You read the Bible uh, in such a way that you might learn something? Okay, or do you read it for a confirmation of what you already believe? Okay, hopefully we are willing to sit at the Lord's feet and allow Him to instruct us. And that best happens in groups. Okay? We need to gather together on a regular basis. If I had a choice, I'd probably stay home and study. I'm terribly introverted. It doesn't matter how much I love people, but if they're in a big group, I get very tired afterwards. Not in a negative way, just physically tired. And it's nobody's fault. It's not God's fault who made me this way, and it's not the church family's fault. I'm just an introvert. Okay? 
I had my, a, a dear friend's mom say to me once, if church is about learning, can't I learn at home? Well, you can learn at home, and I want you to do that, but the discipline also involves getting together. There's this verse in Hebrews, uh, the same chapter that I referred to earlier during the kids' story, uh, but this verse is uh, uh, 1025 of the book of Hebrews. It says, Don't forsake the gathering together, but do so even more to encourage each other as you see the day approaching. Okay, uh, Hebrews 10.25 is telling people to gather together in the same way that they gathered in synagogues before they knew Jesus. It's the book of Hebrews, okay? Uh, the Jewish Christians there. And he says, don't give up getting together. We need each other to be able to understand what God is saying uh, as fully as possible. You know, uh, I've benefited even this year from sitting in a group of God's people. Some of that is live. Uh, I was in Sabbath school sitting in the back trying not to say very much. And Byron told a story about Megan asking him to come home from church, church work, so he could be with her. And I was trying to figure out work-life balance. Still am. But I needed to hear that at that moment. Another example, this was via YouTube because I wasn't here for the live edition, but that was... Uh, the acronym GRACE, you guys remember that, that Sean shared? God's Redeeming Act Covers Everyone. That's unforgettable for me. And there's something that somebody says every week that I probably need to hear. Okay, we need each other. So when Jesus says, whoever hears these teachings of mine, in the parable there, he's talking about uh, us studying God's Word together as well. Here's a, a paragraph from our Adventist heritage that I wanted to share from you. This is from Steps to Christ. And it says there, We sustain a loss when we neglect the privilege of associating together to strengthen and encourage one another in the service of God. Notice those, those great words, privilege. It's a privilege to get together. You think we're always going to be able to meet like this? No, okay. Strengthen and encourage. The truths of his word uh, goes on to say, lose their vividness and importance in our minds. Our hearts cease to be enlightened and aroused by their sanctifying influence and we decline in spirituality. If you stay home, I understand their shut-ins. I'm not talking about people who can't leave. I'm, I'm talking about those of us who are, are tempted to stay home when we could be here. Um, we decline in spirituality. The proper cultivation of the social elements in our nature brings us into sympathy with others and is a means of development and strength to us in the service of God. What if I were to go to uh, Sister White and say, I'm sorry, I'm introverted and crowds exhaust me. What do you think she'd say? Go to church anyway. Okay, take a, take a rest on Sunday or something. Okay. You have to be with God's people in order to keep growing. Now, Jesus said, whoever hears these teachings of mine and does them, that goes back to the mirror and the toothpaste on the lip. Okay, I better wipe it off. Okay, better apply what Jesus says. Uh, most of us know at least one thing that God wants to change in, change in us. I had a guy, this was uh, quite a number of years ago, and... and um, he liked to remind me of how humble he was. <laughs> and he was so humble that he couldn't come to church and, uh, I guess, be soiled with the rest of us. And he was frustrated that I wouldn't call out people's sins from the pulpit. So I thought I'd do that today. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> you already know! Because if you're listening to the Holy Spirit, he's got something he's probably poking you about. Okay, I know that's true for me. He's poking me about some things that I've got to work on. All right? And you have to give God permission to do this. Another, some friends of ours that used to, gather, used to gather together with in their home to study came up with this prayer. And maybe I've shared it before. If I haven't, I'm going to try to beat this drum a lot because I think it's great. Um, God, I give you permission to make whatever changes in me you want. And that takes the pressure off me to figure it out, gives God what He needs, access to my heart to make the changes that He needs to make. Okay? Jesus gives us instruction because He wants us to have the best kind of life. And if that means giving up something that I like, it's only because God has something better for me and for you. God knows what it is 
that is best for us, and we have to trust Him for that. God might ask me to change what I spend money on or, or who I spend time with. Uh, the young man in the children's story, Justin, made the mistake of hanging out with bad influences, and it took him almost all the way away. If it hadn't been for John chasing him into the cave, we wouldn't have that story, okay? Um, those changes might cause pain, but the life on the other side of that pain is worth it. Um, there's, I'm, I'm hesitant to bring this up, but I think it's a good illustration, so I'm going to take the plunge. There's this old song. The song's about 50 years old by now. It goes, you can't always get what you want. You can't always get what you want. You can't always get what you want, but if you try, you just might find you get what you need. God knows what it is that we need. Sometimes that means that He keeps us away from the things that we think are good for us or that we think that we want. He knows what's best. Uh, Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13 say this. Maybe you have this memorized. Keep on working to complete your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Do you remember? Because it is God working in you to help you want to do and be able to do what pleases Him. I got a splinter the other day. This was two weeks ago, or almost two weeks ago. And it went straight into my hand. And I worked on that. And I couldn't get it out. <laughs> so having paid attention in bio biology class, or at least halfway paid attention, I thought, you know, I think there's this thing about the body absorbing foreign objects, if, at least if they're of organic material, right? So I'll just leave it, and the body will absorb it. Five days went by, and I went to release the emergency brake after parking my car and getting back in to go home, and I, I grabbed the emergency brake, and I yelled because it was, it was getting bad in there, infected. So I went home, and I gritted my teeth. And I got a knife, and I got some tweezers, and I went to work. Now, do you think that felt better or worse than grabbing the emergency brake? <laughs> It was worse. I think I went into shock a little bit, but I kept going. And I was working on it and working on it. Finally just started, and you can imagine the horrid, horrid pain if you've ever been through this. And then it popped right out. And it felt so much better. Short-term pain for long-term healing. Now, I still got a mark there. That's because it, the splinter had some wood stain on it. <laughs> So I'll probably always have this illustration marked right here. The short-term pain was worth it in order to get to the healing on the other side. So if God is asking you to leave something behind or to change how you're living life in some way, you better listen to that. Even though it hurts in the short term, the life that He offers on the other side is better. So Jesus says, hear what I say. Listen to, to what I'm teaching you, what the Scriptures say, and then apply it. Because why? The storm is coming. The storm is coming. It could be tragedies and problems in this life. But then we also know that Jesus is coming. And for all of us here, as I've said before, you're either going to be alive when Jesus comes back or you're going to die first. That's true for everybody here. And I hope we're all alive when Jesus comes back. But if not, you've got to be ready either way. Things are coming. The storm is coming. And Jesus' teachings are a way of preparing for whatever is next in your life or in uh, the history of the world. Building codes. Remember, I started out talking about building codes. Sometimes they're a real pain in the neck. But there was this group of guys, a couple of guys, uh, a doctor and his uncle, and they, they saw the building codes and they went further. In 2002, there was a, a hurricane that swept Florida. I don't remember which one. There was a lot of them. And uh, in any case, they decided in 2002 to update their building codes. And any new house, you can't really fix the old ones, but any new house on the coast of Florida had to be able to withstand winds of 150 miles an hour. How many miles an hour? Okay, we'll come back to that. I, can't, I didn't write their names in the notes here, but you can find the news coverage online. Doctor and his uncle were building a new house in a town called Mexico Beach on the Panhandle. And they had the property, and they wanted it to be able to withstand hurricanes. But they looked at the building codes and said, we're going to go further than that. The building codes called for 30-foot footers, those 
those concrete pillars that they build on. But these guys decide they're going to get 40 foot pillars, footers. They put in smaller windows. That's a little strange when you're building a house on a beach. When you have a house on the beach, you have a nice big window so you can see all the things that God is doing in the sky and the sea, right? You know, small, smaller windows. They looked at a plan that had a balcony, but they decided the balcony was not safe. And they ordered a roof that was shaped not like a wing <laughs> so that it would take off. All right, some of you know about that. They reinforced everything. They had the steel cables that went over the tops of the internal structure inside the house. The code in the state of Florida called for houses to withstand winds of how much? 150. These men built their house for winds of 240 miles an hour. And a month after they finished their house, Hurricane Michael came to Florida in the Panhandle. Anybody remember how strong those winds were? You probably don't. That's okay. The winds of Hurricane Michael were 155 miles an hour. And this is their house after the hurricane. It's still there. They did take some damage. Nobody is exempt from suffering. Jesus said, in this world you're going to have trouble. But if you build your house on my teachings, it's like a, a man who builds his house on a rock, and it doesn't matter about the wind and the rain, because that house will stand firm. What if these guys had built their, their house to the codes of the buildings all around them? We wouldn't have this picture, would we? Am I going to live my life like everybody else? Are you? Are we going to enter into the kind of life that Jesus offers? A life that stands through the storm and lasts forever. Let's pray. Um, God, help us. <laughs> help me. Um, each person here has a journey that they're on with and towards you. And I pray that you'd take each of us the next step so that we can be ready for whatever's next. By right, the power of your spirit, we pray this in, in Jesus' name. Amen.